My name is Adam Hansen. I am a fine artist that specializes in landscapes and all things related to the railway. I am also a travel guide and I recommend scenic rail excursions around the world and in the USA. Today is the final event giveaway that we're going to do at the end after I tell you my artist story. So to start off, kind of simple, but I think every good story needs a nice hot drink. So my drink of choice is English breakfast tea with some cream and I'll put in the hot water and let it steep as we begin. All right, we'll come back to that a little later. So again, if you are here for the free giveaway, we are going to do this at the end. Now we're going to talk about today's topic. What inspires you? My road to becoming an artist. I hope that you see that through my story, I'm going to talk about some major themes that I really could apply to anyone's life, to you and your life. And I hope that it ultimately inspires you. I'll talk more about this as we continue on at the end. All right, so just a reminder that there's only two spots left. Again, we are celebrating Open Commissions Week at Adam Hansen Art. So over the last week, I've been trying to educate and talk to you guys about color choices, about mindset, about interior design styles around your different home. And then I gave you some history and some fun facts about commissions. And ultimately, we, just, we studied my friend Kathy yesterday, and we looked at how her love of bagpiping for over 40 years and my love of trains came together and we created her a beautiful piece of commission artwork for her bagpipe art collection. So today is the artist's story. I want to challenge you ultimately to discover what inspires you. So be listening for that. Yes, today you're going to hear a lot about me, but I am going to stop and try and do application along the way. All right. Lastly, again, my commissions will close today at 4 p.m. So you can go to www.adamhansonart.com on your phone in the upper left-hand corner. It's the third tab down. It's called Commission Zone, and it'll walk you through with a video or with text how you can sign up to work with me, and we can create a custom commission for 2023. Now, at the end of every summer and the beginning of fall, my prices do go up. So next February, when I do 2024 Commission Week, it is going to be higher. Get in now while you can. And our special bonus offer, where I was offering a photo album of me actually creating your artwork along the way to come, that bonus offer will go away today at 4 p.m. Okay, so everyone's creative, right? I think so. I think it begins with our childhood. We're encouraged to be creative. And then as we go along, it turns into, well, I you know, I gotta grow up. Or, hey, I can't do that anymore, you know? Now it looks like that. But I wanna tell you that that's not true. Growing up is kind of a made up concept that we put in reality. I'm not saying that everybody can necessarily do exactly what I'm doing, but I am saying that everyone has creativity inside of them and it manifests itself in everyday ways. Maybe it's excellence in how you give a report or a speech at work. Maybe you're really diligent with your accounting job. Maybe you make smoothies right now and you work in the fast food industry and you do it with a smile. You do that with excellence. Maybe it's creativity in your spare time with how you play music. Whatever your passion is, whether it's professional or personal, I truly believe that yes, everyone is creative. So I'm gonna read you a poem now that my wife gave to me just before we got married. And this is pivotal. I'll talk about this in just a second. I have struggled, like many people, with a lot of self-doubt and insecurities and in dealing with imposter syndrome. And along the way through my story, you'll see that I have learned I am not alone, that we, we are not alone in this. We can do life together, and we're meant to. So just before I got married, my wife, because she saw when I was writing love letters to her back and forth from the ship that I would always put doodles on them. And so she bought me my first like plein air French easel and she put this note with it. 
Adam, do you believe in the creative inside you? Do you believe in the falling star? A wink from the sky, a last kiss by the train, lips wet from the rain. Do you believe in the adventures inside you? The curious child, dancing free, running wildly beyond horizons, leaving rainbows of God's promises in your wake. Do you believe in silent walks through the park, whispering trees tickling your senses, calling your heart? Longing to know who you are, do you believe in the illuminated touch of an immortal moment, when a heart melts into another, can't tell one from the other? Commonplace grace, sweet nothings from a lover, do you believe in the creative inside you? The creator that surrounds you, whether you believe it or not. By Tasha Hansen, with inspiration from Shiloh, do you believe in the magic inside you? And then she wrote, Merry Christmas, look in the back. And I was shocked. It was an easel. So, that happened about four years ago. But we're going to go further back. <laughs> All right, so... I'm going to break down this story into five parts, kind of like, I guess you could say, a play. It's got the beginning, the middle, and the end. Part one, the good life never ends, right? Part two, crossroads. Enter envy, jealousy, and shame. Part three, am I good enough? Part four. Standing still. And part five, second chance. Alrighty. The good life never ends, right? Part one. First, a disclaimer. Let me say my life in childhood by no means was perfect. Again, this is meant to be a story for teaching. I can't take the last 28 years of my life and just absolutely give you every little detail. We'd be here way too long and you definitely would lose interest. So just keep in mind that these are overarching themes. I'm a human being just like you. My life is messy, right? Things happen, go wrong all the time. Things go right and I'm super thankful. So when you're listening to this story, please don't think I had the perfect life or the perfect childhood. That just simply isn't true. This is a story. All right, cool. So I grew up in Northeast Ohio, uh, which is in the United States of America. There's a debate whether it's part of the Midwest or not, but I think it is. Um, overall, and I say overall, right? That's a ton of life right there in that one word. But I had a really great childhood. My parents would encourage me to do things. Now, I was an only child, so that meant I got all the attention. Whether it was good, or whether it was other, <laughs> all of it. And there's not too many things you can blame the animals for, uh, especially what's on a higher shelf that the dog or the cat cannot get to. Okay, so what was fun was that my dad is a skilled craftsman. I don't think he would call himself that, and maybe that's making it a little more glamorous, but he's really good with woodworking. He's been a general contractor for my entire life, He's helped build people's houses, revamp them. He's always had fun, creative projects. And then he was also trained as an ink press technician. So making commercial labels. And that is artwork, trying to make that look good with precision and detail. My mom, on the other hand, is definitely the adventurous day tripper. She loves art. She's super savvy deal shopper, loves yard sailing, antiquing, estate sales, you name it. But ultimately, she loves to get outside and adventure. And so you take my father's attention to detail and my mother's day tripping adventure personality and you smash them together and then you have me. Alrighty. So over here, I have my first train set and I think this is important for people to see. So you see it all has to begin somewhere, right? So this was my first train set, like I said early before. 
ironically enough, even though I am a Navy veteran, there's a little sailor here. I guess I was preconditioned. And then this was actually hand me down from like the late 80s. So now we're talking, I was born in 94 and this is something that I still have. My mom recently brought for my children. So there's the early train influences. And yes, my favorite story as a kid was definitely The Little Engine That Could. Great book to teach children, I believe, about resilience. Next, this is kind of fun for people to see. All right, I will zoom in on here, but this is Christmas of 1998. I was given by my grandfather a little Tykes art desk. This was like the gateway to the art world for me. My parents put it in the kitchen and I just went to town. I would spend hours organizing my colors and I'm about four or five here and coloring books and scribbles and watercolor. It was just a big happy mess, honestly. But this was cool because this is how I spent a lot of my personal time before I ever went to kindergarten. And then as I continued on, I kept coming back to this art desk, kind of like a place to just stop and think. And yes, in that picture, it's a little hard to see, but I am sporting a train sweater. <laughs> All right. So by the time I got to kindergarten, right, they just let you play and make a mess. There was the paint corner. And I think this is fun because although I didn't spend all my time there, I wasted so much paint. I would just honestly take it, squeeze it into the water, and then just keep mixing it to see what color I gave it for water to turn. And honestly, every single time, it was kind of like insanity doing the same thing over and over again. But I'd get this strange, funky smell and chocolate milk color. You definitely don't want to drink that. Alrighty. My first, and so along the way too, I will be mentioning key people that have helped me along my journey. I'm not gonna go super long into detail, but they definitely are major milestones. The reason why I had the disclaimer at the beginning of my story with childhood is I know that not everybody has a nice childhood. Not everybody is fortunate enough to have both parents in the home. Not everybody has their grandparents around. And so that's why I'm also talking about these key people that I've met in my life that are not blood related, that helped me out and definitely have become just as important in my walk as an artist and as a person throughout time. And so they deserve to be mentioned. All right, first person, Mrs. Newhall. So Mrs. Newhall was definitely like, towards the end of her career, I think she was in her like late 60s, early 70s, but she really had a passion for teaching. And it was evident to me as a kindergartner first grader. So in first grade, I was getting exposed to Van Gogh and Starry Starry Night. And what was fun is that we would do different projects and work on different things, but then I would finish my project early. Maybe I'd rush through it. Maybe it really didn't even look that good. But Mrs. Newhall would bring me to her side and she would also say, hey, let me give you some extra art materials and let me give you some extra projects to do. And hi, Leia, thanks for joining us. I see you there on Instagram Live. And then she would say, okay, why don't you take these back to your seat or you can even take them home and work on this project and then bring it back when you come to art class. This was like great. So now I'm getting a teacher who's paying special attention to me, right? What kid doesn't love that? But then she's also teaching me extra additional art skills that she'd be willing to teach anyone in the class. I'm just next to her side and she's honoring that. That's like super special. Thank you, Mrs. Newhall. All right. So the other thing that is, and this is not like we intentionally did this. This was just, again, fun day tripping. My mom would spend a lot of time taking us to Ohio Amish country. And then she would also say, hey, why don't we go check out this art festival? And my dad enjoyed it too, so we'd go. At a young age, looking back, this is like really critical now that I'm stepping out as an artist and entrepreneur. I saw people making a living creating artwork, creating beautiful like 
walnut furniture or things out of teak wood or creating beautiful paintings of landscapes or of trains. Like one of the coolest things we saw and we did buy them is a guy would take stamps, cut them out, make them three dimensional, and then he would frame and map them. And that was his artwork. He would be stylizing and making stamps three dimensional. That was like so cool. And so as I would see these things over the years, my parents and I would always dream and be like, oh, well, what if we did this? And what if we did that? And my dad in his own right and his mom as well were entrepreneurs. My dad had his own construction business during my childhood as a general contractor. And then my grandmother also had her own business making handmade knit things. It was like the pre-birth of Etsy, you know? So this was cool for me as I grew up to learn that like, hey, you can do your own thing and maybe you have to work a second side job or it takes time to get there, but you can do fulfilling things ultimately in your life that make you smile and help other people more importantly. Alrighty. So the last thing I'll say too is after the art circuit for this chapter for part one, I would read a ton of books. Now disclaimer, I was not a whiz kid. I was definitely struggled hard with reading. I had to have a reading tutor, tutor K through four. But once I got reading, it became a joy to me. And then I just started to discover what was in books and learn about faraway exotic lands and places. This was cool. And this is a large part of what inspired me. But most of my days as a kid were really just spent with my dogs playing in the backyard, stuffing my face with mulberries and getting way too much poison ivy. <laughs> All right, part two, crossroads. Enter envy, jealousy, and shame. So again, every good story starts with a hot drink. I'm drinking water because I'm talking so much, but definitely grab your tea or your coffee and join me for this story. And then the live giveaways at the end. So I talked about K through second grade, and that's important because third grade, things kind of flipped on its head for me. In third grade, we had a new student come in. This guy was super good at art. And for me, I became really insecure because at that time I had been one of the better artists in the class. And the teacher went on and on and on about praising this guy. And I just got sick of it. And so I was like, okay. Okay, he had painted a cardinal. We'll call him Bobby. So Bobby painted this, uh, drew this cardinal on cloth with like a really, really nice pine tree and pine cone. And she was like, oh, he did such a nice job, all this skill, all this talent, not praising anyone else in the room. And so I was like, okay, Bobby, you wanna go? Let, let, let's go. So we'd go to the library once a week and I started pulling out bird drawing books from the library. I started pulling out like, different plants and I became honestly like obsessed with just drawing nature and trying to get and beat Bobby. When you're a kid, you don't think about these things, but I got comfortable being one of the better artists in the class and I liked the praise that I was getting from other people. And so all of a sudden someone else is getting praise and I couldn't handle it as a kid. I don't think most kids have the emotional capacity to truly understand something like this at this age. And so I just started envying him. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to try and do what he was doing. And then I was jealous because I wanted to get that praise. So where's the shame come in, Adam? Well, again, I talked about going back to my art desk and I would always be making art and be trying to show it to my family members and try and get their praise. And then finally, one day I was doing my art, trying to grasp for this, you know, attention from other people. Um, and I had a relative question my masculinity and my identity. And it was just, they were straight up. They were like, hey, if you keep doing art, you know, like, isn't that what girls do? And don't you need to be doing more boy things and all these other things? And it really messed with me. It really sent me into emotional tailspin. And so now we're gonna come back to this analogy at the end. I want you to imagine 
A Road. And one of my favorite other books from my childhood, which is just simply called Choo Choo, is about to choosing two paths. One is an into, I want you to close your eyes. One is a set of railway tracks. I'm a train artist, so let's use this train analogy. One is a set of railway tracks veering to the left into a sunny field. And then the other set of railway tracks, it splits as switch track, goes to the right into a dark forest. It's that simple. Well, I went right. I'll just be straight honest right here at the front. Hard right into the deep dark forest and it was in that place where i really started to lose myself and you're like adam how old are you again what is the third grade what are we talking about yeah i'm only nine years old i think a lot of people underestimate what children can experience and then how whether it's reality or not it becomes their emotional reality and they replay it into adulthood i'll talk briefly about this later with one of my top favorite books called boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud and Chris Thompson. So, in this forest, if you will, I started to believe lies about myself, about the world around me, and culture. The biggest one, if I create, because I'm a guy, it is shameful, and people will see me less than a man. So I have to hide it, and it can't be shown. So the direct reality of this was in my family, right? Everyone would be used to see me come up all excited about my artwork. Now when people wanted to see my artwork, I got weird about it, quite frankly. I got a little edgy, you know? I, I was starting to hide it, and I was like, no, no, you can't see it. Or someone would be like, hey, you know, you're gonna make me a, a birthday card this year? And I started resenting the people around me that were asking me to do the shameful thing, right? And create art and be expressive. And so I really struggled with this throughout all of my childhood. And I, but I still had key people along the way that were speaking positively into my life. So I will say, I don't ever know what happened to Bobby, um, but it was an important point in my life. And I wish Bobby well. If I hadn't had healthy competition, as I know to call it today, I probably would never have progressed to this point and wanted to pursue art. Because again, we really are all given talents at our life, but everyone says, oh, you're talented. Oh, you're gifted. Of course you're doing this. This makes sense. Well, I just want to stop the bus, beep, beep, and back it up and say, hey, all of us, like I said at the beginning, are creative. And we all have the capacity to be creative and artistic. It's just where you apply it. For me, it manifests itself into these trained and landscape paintings. But again, for you, it might be just doing excellence at your accounting job or giving a report at a marketing firm. Or again, it could just be you're working the fast food industry right now. Maybe you're in between jobs or that is your job and you serve people with excellence and customer service. You set the salt and pepper shakers on the table and the silverware and make them look beautiful. Whether you're at McDonald's or like a local diner like Denny's or you're working in the top like steakhouse in the city. It doesn't matter. Creativity manifests itself everywhere and is all around us. Okay. So I got the, we got this shame dialogue going in the background. We talked about that. Alrighty. Fifth grade. So third to fifth grade, I discovered that uh, a book about ancient Egypt Again, I started really liking books and I love the way they did artwork in ancient times. Got really, really deep into Egypt in that season of my life and studying that artwork. And then in fifth grade, so much so, I connected with my art teacher, Mrs. Brown, who would bring me special pages from her home, from her art books, and I'll say, hey, if you want to do extra projects at home, here you go. So at that point, I no longer it was too big to sit at a Little Tykes art desk. I think we'd moved it at that point. Um, and I didn't want to look at it anymore because I was upset with myself from before. But I'd still like draw in my sketchbooks and have big paper pads in my room. And I'd do these extra art projects. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Funny thing, though, is that, right, I think most kids are super impressionable. I watched Back to the Future 3 
during this time frame. And I thought it was the most epic story ever, right? If you've never seen it before, I guess it's kind of a spoiler alert. But at the end, there's a train scene. And they're trying to race back to get back into, like, the future. I think it's 1989. And... They have to get the train up to a certain speed because they're pushing the time machine. And if the time machine doesn't hit 88 miles per hour, it won't go back to the future. And so the end of the scene is they make it, but the train in the 1880s hurls off a bridge, fires smoke into a canyon, and it's just super epic. And then it has a happy ending because the bridge rebuilds itself into modern times in the 1980s. And then it comes back at the live at the end and everything's good to go. So naturally, I'm like, okay, this is normal. It has a happy ending. But I was fixated on the burning train launching off a bridge. And I drew it ad nauseum again and again until my teachers at a parent-teacher conference were like, do you know what Adam draws at school? Uh, is this normal? And it became a running joke in my family. So, scared the teachers. Got to be a little crazy to be an artist, I guess. All right, so in, I talked about how in K through second, I'm studying like Van Gogh and Starry Starry Night and some other things, some of those other flower horticulture pictures. Well, by the time I got to sixth grade, now I'm studying Picasso and I'm making my own prints for the first time. And we're studying abstract cubism. Again, I know not everybody is afforded these opportunities. I did have an excellent school system that I grew up in. And I was able to take art K through 12. A large part of a lot of these teachers and support structures came from me having a good public school system. So thank you. Stowe, Ohio. Okay. So this continued in the seventh grade and my confidence is getting boosted. I'm starting to get pulled back out of my shell again. And in seventh grade, I was, I was doing my, what was it, seventh grade? In seventh grade, I was leading and learning, and I was like, okay, well, maybe I should step out, but I'm not sure if I should step out. Uh. And finally, my mom just, like, pushed me while I was going into eighth grade, and she's like, listen, I know you want to do the school play. Don't worry about what other people think. Just go for it. I was terrified. I was like, I have to wear makeup, and I have to stand up in front of people and talk, which is not so hard for me, but the wearing makeup thing was totally, like, scary to me. And I was like, all these blinding lights, and I've never talked in front of more than, like, family, right? And so there's going to be a room filled with, wait, wait, how many people again? That was a huge confidence booster. And my best friend and his dad came and watched me, and they supported me. And the reason why I'm talking about a play now, as I became an artist, is because a lot of what artists do, again, is right now. It's talking to people and being in front of people. And so in eighth grade... I also, after that experience, an art contest came up in the city to paint a mural on city windows for Halloween. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And so because I had that experience in the play, I had the confidence to apply for my first art contest. And my submission was accepted and I painted it. And it's a really proud moment for me because this is when I started to believe that what I had to offer as an artist could help people and entertain people or meet a need. Alrighty, let's pause real quick in the story. I'm gonna get some water and then we'll talk about the giveaway if you haven't heard about it yet. Okay. And I'm also gonna set a timer so we don't go over time. So just let me get that up really quick. Beautiful. All right. So the Two Trains Guidebook. I've been talking about this for like the last two or three weeks. This is an epic train guide. One of the resources I personally use to recommend cool train trips to you all over the world and in the USA. This one is geared towards the USA and Canada. It is. It has cool, fun descriptions about different scenic railroads, scenic dinner trains. And honestly, if you're not super into trains and you just like traveling or something to distract yourself on the weekend, like my mom, who's an avid day tripper, still is, this is a cool book. It's pretty thick. I'll show you the binding here. 
And I'm going to raffle it off at the end for everyone that participated. I'll talk more about that later. Alrighty. Part three. Am I good enough? So again, I was talking about how my healthy, my unhealthy inner dialogue continued into high school. And I am so, so thankful. I'll talk about her more in a minute for Michelle Serena. She was my art teacher from ninth to 11th grade. And I still talk to her today. She is awesome. She teaches at high school full time, ninth through 11th. And then she is also a practicing artist herself that shows. Okay, so just before we get to high school, in eighth grade, I had a reality check. Uh, the beginning of a reality check, I guess you could say. Counselors came in and you're like, what kind of counselors? Guidance counselors came into like English class one day and they're like, oh, so do you know what you, what you want to do when you grow up? I'm like, I have no idea. And we, it was this big thing. They talked about college. We had to make a presentation for maybe something we're interested in doing later in life. At the time, I had chose landscape architecture. And when I started to talk to family and other people around me, the idea of a starving artist came in by saying, yeah, hey, I don't know many people that make a living as an artist. So therefore, if you want to pursue and do art, I don't think it's a good call. You should probably do something else that makes more money. And I started to believe that too. And so I just mixed that in with the shame. And then now you can't be an artist when you grow up. So don't even think about that. And so I'm like, okay, I don't really know what I want to do. Um, let's go home and talk to my dad. He's a pretty reasonable guy. So I asked my dad, I was like, hey, do we have money for college for me to go to college? And he was just really honest. I really appreciate my father. He's a good willed man. He was like, hey son, hey Adam. No, if you want to go to college, this is what I was talking about, getting good grades. And I went, oh, <laughs> okay, okay, now it's serious. Now I want to go to college and do something more after schooling, get extra schooling, and it, it costs money, right? You don't have to worry about money when you're a kid normally. Your parents take care of all that. So now I'm starting to go, oh, no, now I have to perform. Now I have to do really well. Now I have to make it if I want to do anything. And so at this point, I was going into pushing myself. I was like, how do I go into the next best place? How do I get into that higher class? How do I prove myself and say, am I good enough to make it? Not just, and this at this point, I'm not even thinking about making it as an artist. I'm just talking about making it in life. Can I provide for myself? Will I ever be married? Will I ever have kids? All of these things that we as humans deal with, looking for relationships, looking for love, looking for respect, looking for prominence or recognition. All of these things tie into every single person and the human condition. So at this point, my grandfather had mentioned, hey, I was in the Navy after I got out of college. He said, yeah, I served in Vietnam, but it was one of the happiest times of my life. I traveled the world got a paycheck doing it. Oh, and by the way, now they'll pay for school. And I was like, well, I know I'm not the smartest kid in the class. And so I could probably should take all the help I can get. And I started gearing my entire life towards the military. And then the more I looked into joining the US Navy, the more I was like, okay, well, maybe if I join the Navy, no one will ever question me as a man again. I'm, I'll be able to hide my shame and I won't, you know, I can just do as much artwork between now and the end of high school and then I'll just stuff it down and I'll just grow up, put away childish things and be a normal person, right? Solid plan. Go. <laughs> that is not how the story goes, obviously, as I'm talking to you right now. So when I got into ninth grade, I'm going to talk back about Michelle Serena. When you get to high school, at least in my school system at the time, it was optional to take art. Well, I still wanted an outlet. And so what better excuse than to be in a class where people have to sit there anyways and just do art for an hour as an elective. 
and I can just pour my heart out. Nobody has to know about all the craziness that's going on inside of me, and I can just express myself in a safe place. Like, that's cool. Michelle Serena came up to me one day, Mrs. Serena, as I'll call her from now on, and she was like, hey, I like your abstract portrait. I'm getting together uh, several other artists' portraits that I think, you know, really met the intent of the project. I'm going to put them in the principal's office. Are, are you okay with that? And I'm like, um, sure. Right? It's the principal's office. Only the principal and a couple people are going to go in there. Not many people are going to see it. I, I should be safe. I should be fine. So I keep pouring my heart out, doing the best that I can in the class. And she comes up to me at the end of the year. And she's like, I think you should take art too. You look like you really enjoy this and you should keep going. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I went home and talked to my mom and my mom's like, yes, yes, definitely you should do art too. And I'm like, I don't know. Because now all of a sudden if I keep taking art and it's optional, people are going to start associating me with art. And do I really want that? Right? I got all the stuff in the baggage here that I'm hauling along here. And if someone opens the bag, I'll be found out, right? I'll have been an imposter. So in 10th grade, I did decide to take art too, but I also met um, my favorite teacher in high school. And I'm mentioning I have multiple favorite teachers. Obviously, I really enjoy Mrs. Serena. Um, but Mr. Van Auken, he's the only teacher I'd ever had in 12 years that made it known to me at least, who had a second career. So he'd worked in business and marketing his entire life and held multiple positions, retired in his 40s, and then went back to school to get his teaching degree. Why? Because he realized what he was most passionate about in life was teaching people and helping kids get set up for success in their life. And so we'd have many conversations together, and he introduced art history. And we started looking at um, the Dutch High Renaissance and the Italian High Renaissance, and these different pivotal moments throughout history where art transitioned and changed culture forever. That's cool, Mr. Van Aken. He also was just a super real person. He'd relate to us through his experiences and through his failures. I was really, really impressive and refreshing to have somebody that had been out there in the workforce and then come back and share that with kids that were literally launching into young adulthood. Next, I'll also talk about, so at the end of 10th grade year, this is when it started to get really, really real. Just be like right here, this is where it gets real. Mrs. Serena came up to me and she said, hey, I really like this art project that you just did. Again, I, I think you really captured, you know, what the vision was for the project. And I want to submit it to the governor's show or for the state of Ohio. And disclaimer, I did not win the governor's show. You know, but the fact that I had a teacher that came up to me and believed in me so much so that she wanted to take my artwork and she believed and put it in front of art critics and judges and the state for youth blew me away. And in my mind, I started to have this shift, kind of like this, this snap, if you will. And I'm like, why do you care so much? Why are you going through all this effort? Like, I'm a nobody. I'm just a normal person. I'm just doing my thing. And I'm just trying to hide. And I wanted to say no. And just kind of like, let me be. And so I did let her submit it. But then it was just like, at that point, I was wondering, I was like, okay, well, does anybody like it? And she came up to me at the end of the year. Again, you're noticing a pattern here. She pursued me. She saw that I was passionate about something. And then she also saw that I wasn't pursuing it. So she pursued it for me. And she said, hey, I think you should take honors art in 11th grade. At this point, my mind is like blown. I'm like, I don't, don't deserve to be an honors art. Are you crazy? And so now I am really starting to manifest my fears and insecurities. I said, okay, I'll take the class. 
on condition. I will do all the assignments, but I will not be in the class. I'm going to take it as an elective. And so I filled it with like honors biology or something. And I hid because I was too afraid to be critiqued by my peers. And again, start to really be associated with the art kids. I was terrified to be found out because I didn't think people would see me as a man or that I wouldn't be able to attain manhood and all these crazy made up cultural things. So we get to obviously, and so now at this point, I start meeting other teachers and you have to take government, you have to learn how to be a citizen if you live in America and different things. And um, my economics teacher, this was the government, part of the government's course, his name was Mr. John Moyer, and he was super, like, down-to-earth and real. Very similar to Mr. Van Aken. And I was stressing. At this point, just to put you in the time frame, I'm trying to get into the United States Naval Academy. I am putting, I am spreading myself so thin that I have a mental breakdown. What am I talking about? I'm doing, I'm doing the art. I'm doing drama club. I'm trying to be in all these honors AP classes, if they'll let me, right? If I can qualify and get to the next level, even though I'm like, I don't belong here, but we're just gonna thrust and do it. I'm trying to be on student council. I'm trying to then now do track. And I'm just pulling so hard at the oars by myself and not asking for help. I burn out, just poof, snuff the candle, gone. And this teacher saw me burning out so he told me a story, like I'm telling you. And we talked about the importance of saying no and how boundaries in your life are what help keep you mentally sane and stable. And so I started to rein back a little bit, but I'm still terrified because now it's junior year and I'm trying to see, okay, I'm gearing up to go into the military. This is really what I want to do, but I feel like I have to do it. I feel like I have to cover up the shame that I'm feeling, this imposter syndrome, and just, I gotta keep it going so nobody knows what's really behind the mask. And so after I had my mental breakdown junior year, during that summer, I called my best friend's dad and I'm going on and on. I'm like, I know I'm supposed to take AP physics, but I can't do the math. I don't know how to do calculus. And I said, what I really wanna do is take AP art. He was like, Adam, just go for it. It's okay. It's not going to be the end of the world. Just just do it. It's okay if you switch it out. Take ready your physics, you know, whatever it is. And so thank you to Mr. Andrew Freeborg, my best friend's dad. And so he really helped set me up for success because ultimately, even though I chose to go to military school, he just was a voice. He listened to me freak out and go on. And ultimately, as I entered senior year, the best advice I got from self-help books, from other people around me, was, hey, just don't stand still. And I think this is really important for anyone at any season of life wanting to make a change in their life. Change is not instantaneous. 